Okay, thanks, Titus. All right, uh, good morning to everyone. Um, uh, we, uh, we're going to be uh, continuing. We're, we're rapidly coming to the end of uh, Paul's epistle to Titus. We're in the final chapter, and uh, this morning we're going to be noting uh, verses 4 and 5 of Titus chapter 3, and uh, it's a great passage. This is a lot of great theology here. In fact, a reference to the uh, Trinity is involved here in, this, in these verses. We're going to see in these verses... Titus 3, 4, and 5, the Father, Paul teaches that the Father saved us, the Christian, when he manifested his compassionate love for mankind during the first advent of Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross and then rose from the dead. He brought up, he, he, his work on the cross and his resurrection brought about our deliverance, our salvation. It gave us the, uh, the offer of salvation. In fact, Christ's death and resurrection provided the offer of salvation to all mankind, and of course, Christians are those who have exercised faith in Jesus Christ, and now the Holy Spirit, at the moment of our conversion, has appropriated for us what Christ had done for us. So we're going to talk about salvation a lot here this morning and what that is. Uh, we've talked about it in the past, and a lot of, in fact, I just did a new article that's on our website. Uh, uh, well, I'm, going, I'm working on it now, actually, I should say, and I'll be sending it to Titus in the, in the, in the future. But uh, a lot of Christians don't understand what salvation means, so this class hopefully will help you in uh, understanding what salvation is all about and what we are saved from, what we are delivered from, and so that'll be our subject here uh, this morning. And just a, a few announcements. Uh, remember, uh, we will have no classes um, Sunday, August 3rd, and Sunday, August 10th, and also the weekday classes from, you know, the, uh, the weekday classes of... Uh, the uh, the fifth, sixth, and seventh, and also the twelfth, thirteenth, and fourteenth. We won't have um, classes during those times. I'll be uh, I'll be out of town, uh, back east, and then uh, also Titus and Jody are uh, out of town. Uh, this seeing family and friends uh, the first week in August. So um, just keep that in your calendar, and also keep that in mind too, because when we, you know, well that mean that means we'll miss like two offerings. So keep that in mind. So when we. Uh, when we uh, we do get to that point, um, also um, what else? We have our, our website is all uh, completed, and of course, kind of uh, interesting that uh, you know, as soon as Titus you know finishes that, and he did a great job with it. His uh, hard drive crashes on his computer, so <laughs> there's always something going on. So the poor guy is like, on you know, finally, so he's gonna well have a new drive in here. Uh, right now, he's he's got he's he's my kind of guy. He always has a backup system for everything, so. That's, he's back there, and the, uh, so it's uh, kind of funny. So uh, I say funny in a sense, not in the, in the funny that he, his drive crashed, but that you know, there's always something. But uh, yeah, so uh, keep that in prayer so that he, he gets back up to snuff because uh, we do a lot of stuff. He does a lot of stuff there for the ministry with the uh, the website and everything, and there's other stuff that he, you know, we run the classes here, we video record them, and so that PC that he, his hard drive has crashed on that, so he uses the back, the one in the back uh, behind him. So uh, if you keep that in prayer. Also, uh, what else? I think uh, that's about it. Um, we're going to, as um, far as uh, coming attractions, uh, I haven't, um, I haven't decided what, there's several, a couple of different books I'm thinking of doing after Titus, and I also I'll probably do, I'm more than likely going to do some, um, uh, a couple of topical studies bef before we go to the next book after Titus on Sunday. So I haven't decided what subjects I want to do, um, but because um, there's a bunch of them flipping around, what I want to do, I have several options. But I'm just thinking about what's best uh, would be the best for us. And uh, also, when I, our our class schedule uh, during the class, uh, we have classes during the week. Obviously, you guys know that. But uh, for those who are new to the ministry, our class schedule t is Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Uh, we're teaching the book of Daniel, and we have an hour cl hour long class. Uh, every every class is different. There's a new sermon every night, so that's four four sermons during the week, and uh, we record them, video, and put them on our website, which is uh, as I said before, brand new. All right, uh, we're gonna. If you could turn your Bibles, okay, th therefore to Titus chapter three, verse one, and also you should have my translation of Titus chapter three in front of you, and also in your songbooks, if you could turn your pay uh, your songbooks to page eighty nine. We're going to do Isn't He? So page 89 in your songbooks, and also Titus chapter 3, verse 1 in your Bibles, and also you should have my translation in front of you. 
And I think that's about it. Let's take a moment of silent prayer, as is our custom. We do this so that we can uh, examine ourselves and see if we need to confess any sins to the Father. And uh, this restores our fellowship with God and the filling of the Spirit. Uh, we're ma we maintain our fellowship with God and, and the filling of the Spirit by, again, bringing our thoughts into obedience to what the Holy Spirit says to us through the teaching of the Word of God. So uh, with that in mind, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great privilege and honor that you've given to us to study your word. Uh, we pray that we would never take it for granted, your word, and we just thank you so much, Father, for the, for the things that we've been learning in your word, in Paul's epistle to Titus, and also uh, the classes during the week with regards to the book of Daniel. We thank you, Father, for the, the great privilege that you've given to us to be uh, part of a ministry, a gospel ministry that promotes your, your gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, to a lost and dying world, and also to uh, provide the word of God for those who are believers and for their spiritual nourishment. We thank you for uh, calling us into service, and we just thank you, Father, that we can serve you and help us to serve with proper motivation out of love and appreciation for what you've done for us through both your son and the spirit. We pray, Father, that we thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son. We thank you for your great sacrifice. And we thank you for revealing to us in, your, in the pages of Scripture that in eternity past, before anything was ever created, you elected us and uh, to, privilege, to the privilege of having a relationship and fellowship with you, with you and your Son and the Holy Spirit. You predestinated us to be conformed to the image of, son, of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the, whole, the Son's work at, at the cross and his substitutionary spiritual and physical death that delivered us from sin, the sin nature, the devil and his cosmic system, uh, condemnation from the law, spiritual death. Uh, we just thank you, Father, uh, in eternal condemnation. We thank you for delivering us from all these things through your son's death and resurrection, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. At the moment of conversion, when he identified us with your son in his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session at your right hand, thus giving us the victory over sin and Satan, giving us deliverance from all these things that were our enemies. We just pray, Father, that you would help us by, uh, to uh, appropriate by faith our position in Christ so that we can experience this deliverance over sin and Satan, that we could have experience your joy and fellowship with you, and that we might be able to grow to maturity and become like your son, and thus through our conduct, godly conduct, uh, not only grow up to spiritual maturity, but also evangelize through our conduct, uh, our non-Christian friends and family members and neighbors. Uh, we just uh, thank you for everyone that is here this morning. We thank you, Father, for each and every person in the Thompson home, and also those who might be viewing or listening to this class uh, through our website at a later date, or, or right now uh, listening or viewing this class through Pal Talk. We just pray, Father, that each person here this morning would receive their necessary spiritual nourishment. Uh, help them to all concentrate and to listen to what the Holy Spirit is going to say to each one of them as individuals and as a unit. We also pray that you would give grace to the communicator. Uh, help me to uh, speak clearly and communicate clearly your word to your people so that they are built up and edified spiritually. Uh, help me to be your instrument. and Pray, Father, for... Uh, Titus, with the sound and the recordings, we pray you give him wisdom in that area. Thank you for his service there. We also thank you for Titus and Jody opening up their home to us. We thank you for their hospitality. And Father, we thank you most of all for you and your Son and the Holy Spirit and just calling us and giving us the privilege to have a fellowship with you here this morning. We pray that we would worship you, whether it's through learning or teaching or giving or fellowship or singing that we would bring glory to you and your son, Jesus Christ, and that our worship of you and your son 
would be acceptable. So, Father, we pray for these people and things in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Could you all rise, please? And again, page 89, isn't he? We'll be singing. Isn't he beautiful, beautiful? Isn't he Prince of Peace and Son of God? Isn't he, isn't he, isn't he? Isn't he wonderful, wonderful? Isn't he counselor, almighty God? Isn't he, isn't he, isn't he? Isn't he Prince of Peace and Son of God? Isn't he? Isn't he? Isn't he? Isn't he? Isn't he Counselor Almighty God Isn't he Isn't he Isn't he Prince of Peace And Son of God All right, uh, you should be at Titus chapter 3, verse 1, uh, both in your Bibles and also my translation. Let's read from, I'm going to read from the New American Standard, uh, the uh, paragraph that's uh, contained in verses 1 through 7 of Titus chapter 3. It says in Titus 3, 1, and again, I'm reading from the New American Standard at this point. Remind them, the Cretan church, Titus, to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be peaceable, Gentle, showing every consideration for all men. 
For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom the Holy Spirit, he, the Father, poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, if you look at my translation of those verses, which, of course, reflects my interpretation of those verses, it says in verse 1, continue making it your habit of reminding them to make it their habit of voluntarily subjecting themselves to governmental rulers, or in other words, governmental authorities, by making it their habit of being obedient, to be ready for any kind of act which is divine good in quality and character, they are to be characterized as slandering absolutely no one, to be characterized as peaceable, magnanimous, with the result that together they show every consideration for each and every member of the human race. For we ourselves also, at one time, were existing in the state of being foolish ones, disobedient ones, deceived ones, those enslaved to various lusts as well as pleasures, continually spending our lives in malice as well as envy, hateful ones, hating one another. But when the kindness, yes, the love for mankind originating from the Savior, who is our God, was manifested, he saved us. And then it goes on to say, of course, I wasn't ready there. And uh, it goes on to say in the next, uh, in the next verse, uh, in the next statement, by no means on the basis of meritorious actions as constituting its source. In other words, on the basis of human self-righteousness, which we have, ourselves have done, but rather on the basis of his mercy as constituting the standard by means of a washing produced by regeneration, specifically a renovation produced by the Spirit who is holy. Whom he, the Spirit, the Father, uh, whom the Holy Spirit, the Father poured out upon us in full measure through Jesus, who is the Christ, our Savior. The divine purpose was accomplished so that we became heirs in order that we can confidently expect to experience eternal life because we've been justified by this, his grace. Now, if you notice, the Trinity is all, every member of the Trinity is mentioned there. And also, uh, and that means that the Father is the one who came up with the plan to save us. And then the Son uh, uh, accomplished that plan with his death and resurrection. The Holy Spirit is the member of the Trinity who comes into our lives and appropriates that salvation that Christ accomplished for us through his death and resurrection. That's what regeneration and the baptism of the Spirit is all about. So each member of the Trinity is involved and saving us. Uh, we see that the Father is mentioned as our Savior, but if you also notice, Jesus is mentioned as our Savior. The Father is called our Savior because He's the one who came up with a plan to save us, and the Son is the one who accomplished that plan. And, and the Holy Spirit could be called our Savior as well, but He's the one who is appro appropriating for us the salvation that Christ accomplished for us through his death and resurrection. What does it mean to be saved? A lot of people talk about it, but they don't know what they're being saved from. And some people, uh, you know, there are some people, uh, they, when you give them the gospel, you got to you got to communicate what they're being saved from. Uh, if they don't know what they're being saved from through Jesus, faith in Jesus, why are they going to want to get saved? If, if we don't tell them what they're saved from, they're never going to see the need for Jesus. So what, first of all, what God did, because we're all sinners by nature and by practice, and he's holy, he delivered us from eternal condemnation in the lake of fire. If you don't say that to somebody, that, that faith in Christ delivers you from eternal condemnation, or in other words, hell, they're not going to see the need for Jesus. They're not. So the good news, the bad, first of all, the bad news is this. We, we're condemned to the lake of fire because of being sinners. 
by nature and practice. We're condemned by the law. God's law says we have to be perfect in our obedience, and we're not. Uh, also, uh, we're, uh, delivered, uh, we have, we're enslaved to sin, the sin nature that indwells the biological, uh, 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 biological life that we are in now in these bodies that we have. So we also were delivered from, uh, we have personal sins that condemn us before a holy God. We're enslaved to the devil in his cosmic system. So all these things we need to be saved from delivered from. That's the bad news that we're condemned before a holy God to the lake of fire, condemned by the law, enslaved to the sin and Satan, uh, in bondage to our, uh, under real spiritual death, and in, involved in personal sin that separates us from a holy God. All that's the bad news. The good news, the gospel, that's what gospel means, is that Jesus delivered us from all that. And he who believes in Jesus Christ is delivered from condemnation, delivered from condemnation from the law, delivered from eternal like, uh, the eternal lake of fire, delivered from enslavery to, uh, slavery to sin and Satan, delivered from their personal sins. All these things that we're, we're delivered from through faith alone and Christ alone. Why faith alone and Jesus Christ alone? Because he's the one who accomplished the Father's plan for our salvation when he died on the cross. And when he, was di when he died on the cross and was raised on the cross, he negated what Adam did, which plunged the, his progeny, the human race, into sin. And he, he, he gave us much more than Adam ever lost for us in the Garden of Eden. So those who believe in Jesus Christ, you and I, the Christian, the moment we trusted in Jesus, the Holy Spirit came into action. And he identifies the baptism of the Spirit, first of all. He identified us with Christ and his crucifixion his death, his burial, his resurrection and session at the right hand of the Father. That's called positional truth, meaning God views you as being united with Christ in these events in Christ's life. And therefore, that gives you, instead of being condemned because you were in Adam, now you are in union with Christ, no longer in union with Adam, but through faith in Christ, you are now in union with Christ through the baptism of the Spirit. Also, the Holy Spirit regenerated us. A theological word that means that we're born again. He gave us eternal life. In fact, because the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are eternal life, and they indwell us, that's why we have eternal life. Because the, each member of the Trinity is indwelling our souls. So we have eternal life. And we, have, we experience that per, uh, eternal life the minute we trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior. But once we become Christians and we're in the family of God, we still sin because we're not, God has not taken away these sin natures that we're living in. And so in, when we sin after our conversion, we confess it, and then we do what the Word of God says, and we are back to experiencing our salvation, our deliverance. So fellowship uh, is, is, there's a lot more to fellowship than a lot of Christians realize. Fellowship is, is not only experiencing our sanctification, uh, meaning we're experiencing the fact that we're set apart to, for God's purpose exclusively, but we're also, fellowship is experiencing our salvation, our deliverance from sin and Satan and condemnation from the law. We're free in Christ. We have freedom in Christ. And the, so this is a, a wonderful thing to, to know about and it should be, this is one of the things that we should meditate upon, biblical meditation, where you're meditating upon your position in Christ. Remember, it says in Colossians 3, set your mind on the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That's what you, we, you and I need to do. Paul uh, did this. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, not I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, in this body I live in now, I live by faith and the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So Paul, is. it's interesting here in this chapter, and he did this in chapter 2. He gives some commands to the church at Crete, and then he gives the theological basis reason for doing these commands that he gave them. And he does this same thing as he did in chapter 2. He does it here in chapter 3. Because God was so gracious to us, when we were his enemies and we were uh, repulsive to him because we're sinners by nature and practice, because God did all these things for us and delivered us from eternal condemnation, condemnation from the law, uh, in a slavery to sin and Satan, our personal sins, because he delivered us from all these things, we're obligated and we should be experiencing our salvation, having fellowship with God, and performing good works while we're in fellowship with God by the power of the Spirit. Now, Paul's statements in verses 4 and 5 of, Daniel, of Titus chapter 3 
stand in contrast to what he said in verse 3. Therefore, the contrast is between the Christian's pre-conversion sinful character and actions and the, the character and actions of God the Father, which was manifested, which were manifested through the character and actions of Jesus Christ during his first advent, as well as the work of the Holy Spirit at the moment of their conversion. Or in other words, the contrast is between our sinful character and actions prior to becoming Christians and the, the, the holy character and actions of the Father, which were manifested through the character and actions of His Son, as well as the actions of the Holy Spirit at our conversion. So verses 4 and 5, uh, so we see as a contrast what we were, but what and now we see in verses 4 and 5, what God did for us, who God is and what God did for us. It's not about us, it's about God. We couldn't save ourselves. God had to do it through his son and the spirit. So we, we, not, we, we can't affect our own salvation. Uh, as people who are spiritually dead, which we were prior to becoming Christians, and repulsive to God, we could do nothing for ourselves. God initiated our salvation. He's the one who brought about our salvation. And we, therefore, we cannot take credit for our salvation. So if you're saved based upon the merits of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross and the work of the Holy Spirit, what could you possibly do to lose your salvation? You could do nothing to lose your salvation. Faith is non-meritorious, meaning you, it's, you don't have any merit. When you trust in Jesus Christ, God saves you because of who you have your faith in and not how much faith you have. That's, it, it doesn't matter how much faith you have. It's who you have your faith in that saves you. So we have a great thing that Paul is saying to us here, great theological statement here, and that being, that being the fact that in contrast to who we, we were and what we did prior to becoming Christians, we have a contrast between that pre-conversion state that we were in, and now a contrast with who God is, and his actions, and his character, and the character and actions of the Son, and the Spirit, and bringing about our so great salvation. Now, uh, Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, is actually what we call a temporal clause, which contains a pronosis and an aponosis. Now, the pronosis, the premise is, when the kindness... Yes, the love for mankind originating from the Savior, who is our God, was manifested. And the, pro the apotheosis, the inference from that, is he saved us. So basically, uh, what he's saying here in this temporal clause is that 2,000 years ago, God, the Father, manifested his character and actions through his son's death and resurrection. That provided us our salvation. He saved us at that point. Though in time, later on down the road, we trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior. But what he's saying in this temporal clause in verses 4 and 5 is that 2,000 years ago, God actually provided the offer of salvation for all of us. And you and I as Christians have taken advantage of that. So this temporal clause is telling us, the reader, that the Christian, you and I, received eternal salvation when the Father's kindness, yes, his love for mankind, was manifested, which was during the first advent of Jesus Christ. First advent of Jesus Christ means the first time the Son of God, he became a man 2,000 years ago, that's called his first advent. Or in other words, as we call it in theology, the hypostatic union. The second advent is when he comes to the earth the second time, not the rapture, because he doesn't step on the earth at the rapture. He's in the atmosphere, delivering the church from the, the con, uh, tribulation. He comes to the planet earth a second time, touching the Mount of Olives to establish his millennial kingdom and to uh, incarcerate Satan for a thousand years and remove the unsaved from the face of the earth. And only believers will, be, will uh, experience the millennium to start off with. Now the Christian received, you and I, received eternal salvation during the first advent of Christ. In what sense though? In the sense that his death and resurrection provided eternal salvation for them. For us, the Christian. Therefore, without the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, no one in the human race could be saved. No one. The only person who could save us is Jesus Christ. Now, if you notice this, you look at uh, Islam, you look at all the religions of the world, Buddhism, uh, Confucianism, Je the Jehovah Witnesses, all these religions, all right? Biblical Christianity stands out as unique among all of them because biblical Christianity says the human race 
are sinners by nature and by practice. There's nothing good in us, and in God's opinion, and that only there's a, this, there's a way to get saved, though, through faith alone and Christ alone. The only, play, only religion, if you want to call Christianity that, is Christianity is the only one that says, all right, men are, this is who men are, they're condemned before holy God, but there's a, a savior, and that's Jesus Christ. None of the world's religions can do, say that. They give you, offer no deliverance from sin and eternal condemnation in the lake of fire. They give you no deliverance from Satan. Only Jesus Christ does. He's the only one who's offered himself as the savior of the world. There's nobody else. They get no, and there might be people who say, well, I'm the Messiah, but they don't, they can't do anything about our predicament with a holy God that we're sinners by nature and practice. Only Jesus is able to do something about that because he's the sinless son of God. So, of course, the gospel of Jesus Christ, gospel meaning good news, the good news about Jesus Christ communicates to the sinner God's love for them as manifested at the cross and the need for the sinner to trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. And the sinner's faith in Jesus Christ enables the Holy Spirit to appropriate for them this eternal salvation which was provided through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, uh, uh, go to, uh, hold your place, look at John's Gospel, chapter 3, please. John, chapter 3. Look at verse 1. John chapter 3, verse 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, that means teacher in Hebrew, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him, meaning the, the miracles. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Speaking of the spiritual birth. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of this flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, the minute you trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior and trusted in Him in His death and resurrection as, you, as, as your, the means of being delivered from eternal condemnation, slavery to the devil and sin and, and your personal sins and condemnation from the law, the minute you do that, the Holy Spirit is going to regenerate us and identify us with Christ in his death and resurrection. So that, that's what he's talking about there. Verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of, that, of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one is ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. The Son of Man is a title for Jesus. It's uh, taken from Daniel 7.13. As Moses lifted, he made it a title is what he did. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, as we have seen in the past in, in, in the Old Testament, even so must the Son of Man be lifted, lifted him up must lift, be lifted up, excuse me, speaking of the cross, so that whoever believes, doesn't matter who it is, whoever believes will, be, will uh, in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, notice, believe, that shall never perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. So if you trusted in Jesus as your Savior, you're not judged. He who does not believe, though, has been judged already. Now notice, Jesus is talking about, to Nicodemus, an unsaved person at this point, he ends up being a believer, but he's telling him the truth of the matter. Uh, the, good, the bad news is you're 
go into the lake of fire, you're condemned, you're under the wrath of God. The good news is I can deliver you, just believe in me as your Savior. So he says, he who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. Why? Because he is not, because of his sins? No, because your sins of every person in the human race has been nailed to the cross. Your sins can't condemn you. It's your unbelief in Jesus that condemns you. So because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Look at John 3.36. John writes, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. That's what the God, God says about the unsaved. The wrath of God abides on him. But it won't if he believes in Jesus Christ as his Savior. So go back now, please, to Titus chapter 3, verse 4. So the gospel, which Jesus communicated to Nicodemus, communicates to the sinner God's love for them is manifested at the cross and the need for the sinner to trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. The sinner's faith in Jesus Christ enables the Holy Spirit to then do his work. And he is, when he, what he does at our moment of our conversion is he appropriates for us this salvation, this eternal salvation, which was provided through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, in the promises of this temporal clause in Titus 3, 4, which is in my translation, uh, but when the kindness, yes, the love for mankind originating from the Savior, who is our God, was manifested, that particular temp uh, promises of the temporal clause is emphasizing that the Father took the initiative. Notice Jesus said the same thing to Nicodemus. The Father took the initiative in coming to the aid of the sinner and not the sinner seeking out his help for their plight. Now, there's a theological reason. The Bible teaches that every one of us who was, when we were born, we were born physically alive but spiritually dead. Prior to becoming Christians, we weren't seeking God out. We were running away from God. God was trying to reach us through creation. He was also reaching us through his, our conscience. And he's also reaching us through the gospel that is shared with other people. And the lives of godly Christians, he's trying to reach us that way as well. So God is seeking us out. He was seeking us out. Spiritually dead people don't seek out God, the Bible teaches. How can a dead person spiritually seek God? He's not going to have anything to do with God. God has to take the initiative. God so loved the world. You know, it didn't say the human race came bowing to God saying, we're sinners, have mercy on us. They didn't do that. No, God had to come out and initiate. That's love. His love initiated contact with us. So uh, we see here that this uh, verse 4 there is emphasizing the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ during his first advent as the basis for the Christian's eternal salvation. Whereas when it says, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, speaks of the Spirit's work at, at the Christian's conversion and appropriating for them this salvation, which again, was provided through, by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if you look at verse 4 again, it says, but when the kindness, yes, the love for mankind originating from the Savior who is our God was manifested, when was God's love, compassionate love for sinners manifested? 2,000 years ago through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then it goes on, it's, uh, he goes on to say, he saved us. When, it, when, when Christ appeared 2,000 years ago, that when he died on the cross and then rose from the dead, he saved us, God did at that point. Then it says, he, and he tells us some more about our salvation in verse 5, by no means on the basis of meritorious actions as constituting our salvation source. But in other words, on the basis of human self-righteousness, which we ourselves have done, but rather on the basis of his mercy as constituting the standard. And then he mentions the work of the Holy Spirit. By means of a washing... Produced by regeneration, getting born again. Specifically a renovation produced by the Spirit who is holy. Whom the Holy Spirit, He, the Father, poured out upon us in full measure through Jesus who is the Christ, our Savior. Then he says in verse 7, the divine purpose was accomplished so that we became heirs in order that we can confidently expect to experience eternal life because we've been justified by this, His grace. So the work of the Son and the work of the Holy Spirit 
is a manifestation of God's grace policy towards sinners. Grace means we don't earn or deserve anything. God does everything uh, on our behalf, and all we have to do is exercise faith in his son. And faith is compatible with grace because faith is non-meritorious, and grace, again, is God uh, doing, uh, providing salvation for man uh, based upon the merits of his son, Jesus Christ, and his death on the cross. So we have here... And uh, in verse, uh, in, in verse uh, 4, three in, Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, we have what we call a triadic pattern uh, being, ta- uh, being presented to us. Remember we studied the Trinity? Well, there are many passages that talk about each member of the Trinity working on our behalf in salvation. This is one of those pa- uh, passages which we've studied in our, in our subject of the Trinity in the past. So basically, triadic pattern, uh, it, triadic because uh, you have two, uh, three people involved here, obviously three members of the Trinity. So what these, these verses are telling us is that each member of the Trinity was involved in our salvation. Again, the Father, he's the one who initiated action by sending his son to become a human being and die for our sins on the cross and then raising him from the dead. Then the Holy Spirit came involved when he appropriated the victory, the deliverance, from uh, uh, the salvation that Christ provided through his death and resurrection. So each member is involved in our salvation. Now when it says the, in verse 4, the kindness, yes, the love for mankind, originating from the Savior, who is our God, that refers to the Father here. It refers to the Father's tender, compassionate concern for all of humanity, all unsaved humanity, which is reflected in his desire to treat them with compassion. This tender compassion and concern for unsaved humanity was manifested through his son Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. Uh, Hold your place. Look at Romans chapter 5. Look at Romans chapter 5, please. Look at verse 1. Romans 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith. Faith in who? Jesus. That's clear from the first four chapters of the book of Romans. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom, our Lord Jesus Christ, also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. Not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint. Why? Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts. Through who? The Holy Spirit. Now, how does, how does that happen? Through the teaching of the Word of God, which the Holy Spirit's inspired, and is speaking to me, through me as we read this. So it says, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless at the right time, 2,000 years ago, Christ died for the ungodly, the whole human race. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us. His own love means his love is unique. Who dies for their enemies? God sent his son to die for his enemies. We die for our country. We die for our family and friends. We die, we'll die for our husbands and our wives and our children. We'll die for someone we love. And, but, but they're attracted to us. So we, we have uh, some kind of connection with, a, a deep connection, intimate connection. But God sent his son to die for us who are his enemies. Think about that. That's a love that's not human. That's a love that's unique to God. Only God could do that. And this same love we're supposed to manifest in our marriages and our relationships with each other in the church and our relationships with all people. God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, he's holy. Think of how repulsive that is. Christ died for us. Christ died for Every sin ever committed in human history. Think of all the terrible, wicked sins that you and I have committed and everybody's committed in the human race up to this point and what we'll commit in the future. Think about that. Christ died for all those sins. 
Instead of us being judged for our sins, Christ died for those sins. How can anybody call into question or criticize God at all? God condemned us because of his holy character, but God provided us the means of escape, salvation, deliverance from his wrath. That God says, I'm holy and you're under my wrath, but here's the good news. I've sent my son and you could be delivered from my wrath through this provision I've made for you, my son. How can anybody complain about God? But yet people complain about God because they don't know the gospel. And also the gospel, they don't like the gospel many times because it is a, it's a slap in the man's pride. Man likes to think, mankind likes to think, oh, I could do it on my own. I don't need anybody else. I don't need God. That's the epitome of the devil. His essence of his attitude is e his evil. Is the, the essence of evil is independence from God. So man is proud and many times will not believe in Jesus Christ because of pride. The gospel destroys human pride. You can't get saved if you're arrogant and say, I don't need a savior. You're, just go, you're arrogant like your father the devil if you're like that. So imagine that. God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's what, that's what Paul's talking about in Titus chapter 3, verse 4. Now, what we see here is this is all related to common grace, or we could call it universal grace, which refers to grace that God extends to the entire human race in order to draw them to the Savior, to make understandable the gospel of Jesus Christ for eternal salvation, and refers also to the benefits God bestows on all people. For instance, everyone in the human race, Christian, non-Christian, they all are benefiting from God's grace in what sense? They breathe his air, they, breathe, they drink his water, they eat his food. They take advantage of the material. Everything that we have here has been given to us from God. The materials to build our homes, build cars, to build, everything has been provided for us from God. That's universal or common grace, we call it. But also, when Christ died on the cross for all people, that was universal grace, meaning that was grace God extended to the whole human race. He made the offer of salvation through his son universal for all people. So, also, common grace or universal grace means the Holy Spirit, whoever you, if you're an unsaved person, and you want to, you want, you're interested in the gospel, God, the Holy Spirit, will make it understandable to you, the gospel, so that you, a spiritually dead person, could understand what the gospel is all about, that you are a sinner and need a Savior. In fact, uh, look at John chapter 16. Let me show you this. Look at John chapter 16. So grace is all that God is free to do through, the, through Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. And it's all that God is free to do in imparting unmerited blessings to sinners based upon the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it says in John 16, and look at verse 7. John 16, 7. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage, Jesus says, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And the helper is the Holy Spirit. And he, notice he's a he, not an it. He, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And he defines what he means by that. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Con and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. Meaning my righteousness. Jesus' righteousness. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world, the devil, has been judged. So notice there. Then he says in verse 12, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of mine, my teaching, and will disclose it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he, the Holy Spirit, takes of mine, and will disclose it to you. So the Holy Spirit there, when he convicts the world because of sin, unbelief in Jesus, and Jesus' righteousness, that he's the only one who's righteous and we're not, and tells us about that the devil has been judged at the cross, 
The Holy Spirit, that's universal common grace. But gospel is made understandable by the Holy Spirit to the sinner who's spiritually dead. Why? So that they can make a decision to accept or reject Jesus Christ. So that means when you and I give the gospel, it's not about eloquence. It's about getting it straight and right. Telling the unbeliever what the word of God says. The Holy Spirit's not going to, if we're going to give them a bunch of uh, uh, song and dance, Holy Spirit can't use that. The Holy Spirit's only going to take what he's inspired in the word of God. When we communicate that to the unsaved, then the Holy Spirit's working mightily through us. Now, whether they accept or reject it is not, is, is, we can't control. That's between them and God. But our job is to get it straight and communicate accurately the gospel. You're a sinner, just like I am, and the only way you can, you're in danger of the lake of fire if, if you reject Jesus Christ as Savior. Now, some people say, well, aren't you manipulating them because you, you, the fear of eternal lake of fire? How is that manipulating them? It's the same thing as if you tell your children, if you go and you, t you, you, you go and what we can say, if you go and drive your car off the cliff, you'll be dead. So if the, it's obvious that they're going to go to the lake of fire if they reject Jesus Christ, right? That's in the word of God. Well, why, tell them, why not tell them the truth? That's the situation. So if they believe so that they are delivered from eternal condemnation, great, because that's why Jesus died on the cross, so that they wouldn't have to go through eternal condemnation. Yeah, the fear, the fear of eternal lake of fire is put in them by the Holy Spirit convicting them. And their conscience convicts them that. The conscience that God gave them that. So it, it's no different if you warn your kids, if you do this thing, drive your car really fast off a cliff, you will die. You know, go off to a, a hundred foot or whatever, a big drop, and you're dead. You know, I mean, you don't want them to do that, right? This is what's going to happen if you do that. If you jump out of, of the Empire State Building from the top floor, You'll die. You can't, you can't do If you're going to, don't touch the hot stove. If you put your hand on that hot stove, your hand will burn. You're warning people of the, what's going to happen, the consequences of rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior. You have a responsibility to tell them that. Now, we don't like to do that in our day and age because we like, many times, we like people to like us. And you, you know what? It doesn't matter what other people say about us. It's matter what God thinks about us. So we got to make up our minds that we're going to do, do things to please God or are we going to do things to please people? God doesn't like people pleases. He wants people pleasing him, doing things the way he wants done. What, what, look at the way Jesus talked to Nicodemus. And he got saved. But he was, and he was, the be, he was one of the great teachers in Judaism that time, Nicodemus. And Jesus didn't pull any punches with him. So since God desires... All men to be saved, 1 Timothy 2, 4. God delays his judgment in order that men might trust in his son as their savior. Thus, every moment, every moment that a non-Christian, an unbeliever lives is a sign of God's kindness. Remember some time, one time somebody said to me, oh, you know, he's, you know, yeah, Christ is coming back. You know, this typical, typical scoffer. Yeah, he's coming back. You know, why is he waiting so long? Because it's because he's waiting for you to believe in his son, Jesus Christ, so you, you won't have to face his wrath. The person went like, oh, never thought of it that way. Since yeah, don't mess around. There was a family member I told. Was like, he's delaying because he wants you to trust in his son. Look at 2 Peter. Chapter 3, let me show you that. Every day that a, an unbeliever is on this earth is an, ex, an example, a manifestation of God's grace, his love, his compassion, and his kindness. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 9. 2 Peter 3.9. Toward the end of your Bibles, before sec, uh, first, second, and third John. Second Peter three nine, the Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish in the lake of fire, but for all to come to repentance. What is repentance? For the non-Christian, 
is it means a change of attitude. Change of attitude toward who? Jesus Christ. So it's doing a 180. Instead of rejecting him, you accept him as your savior. You, to accept Jesus as your savior means you acknowledge that you're a sinner before a holy God. And you need him to get to heaven. You need him, Jesus Christ, to get saved, to be delivered from eternal condemnation. Uh, look at first Timothy. Back up. You know where Titus is. Before Titus is 2 Timothy and then is 1 Timothy. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. First Timothy two one. First of all, then I urge. Uh, th first of all, then I urge that entreaties and prayers and petitions and thanksgiving be made on behalf of all men, all people, both Christian and non-Christian, for kings and all those who are in authority. Today we'd say that the president, so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Unfortunately, uh, too many people are complaining about the president and our government, and no wonder they don't have a tranquil and quiet life. They don't pray for their leaders in disobedience to God. Look at verse 3. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. What is? Praying for all people, including our leaders. Then it says, God, our, he says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who, God the Father our Savior, desires all men, and men meaning both men and women, it's generic, all people, some Bibles translate it that, all people, uh, desires all men or all mankind to be saved, to come to the knowledge of the truth. Saved from what? Eternal condemnation to start off with. Sin, personal sin. Sin nature, the devil in his cosmic system. Condon condemnation from the law. Then he, so he desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. All men. That means, that's called universal grace. It's also called the unlimited atonement. Some people think that Christ just died for the church. That blows that out of the water. He, in fact, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. You're in 1 Timothy 2. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. Some people will tell you Christ only died for the church, the elect. No, he died for everyone, not just the church. Christ died for all people. So it says in 1 Timothy 4.10, For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who, God, is the Savior of all men. And then look at what it says. Especially the believers. So he's making a distinction there between believers and the, and the unbelievers and that makes it clear that there's an unlimited atonement, atonement, meaning Christ died for all people, both Christian and non-Christian. Meaning, or in other words, those who would believe in, his, in him to, for, savior, for salvation and those who would not. So beware of teaching out there that says Christ just died for those who would trust in him as Savior. Wrong. Wrong. False doctrine. Stay away from it. The Bible blows that. They, they're not, they don't have scripture to back that up. This is another passage that talks about this. In fact, look at you're in 1 Timothy. Go forward a little bit. You'll have uh, Philemon, Hebrews. Go to 1 Peter. Uh, uh, after 1 and 2 Peter, go to 1 John. 1 John is a couple of books before Revelation. So look at 1 John. Chapter 2, look at verse 1. 1 John 2, 1. John writes, my little children, I'm writing these things to you, the things he wrote in chapter 1, so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Then look at it says, and he himself, Jesus Christ, is the propitiation for our sins, our being the church. And not for ours only, the church only, but also for those of the whole world. So he's saying if Christ propitiated the Father for both the church and the non-Christian, how could you say that Christ died for just the elect? That's just, the Bible, it totally blows that doc, false doctrine away. So be aware of that. It's also, a, for people who think that Christ just died for the church and not for all people, is an attack on the character and integrity of God, and it flies in the face of what Scripture teaches. And we just, I've just shown you a couple of passages. Notice he died for the whole world. Think of all that. The Hitlers, the Stalins, the child molester, the idolater, the homosexual, the lesbian. He died for everybody. Everybody in history. The worst villain you could think of. Christ died for that person. So, 
Common or universal grace is grace that is on behalf of the entire human race and it's provided through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Unsaved or unregenerate members of the human race also benefit from this grace when God the Holy Spirit makes the gospel message, which is a spiritual language, understandable to the spiritually dead unbeliever. Now in Titus 3, 4, Paul describes the Father as the Christian Savior, which means that the Father delivered them from eternal condemnation, the sin nature, personal sins and condemnation from the law, Satan and his cosmic system. The Father accomplished this through his son's death and resurrection. So the, uh, the bad news for, the, for us as sinners was we're under eternal condemnation because of our sin. But the good news is Christ died for us and that we've trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior and now we're delivered from eternal condemnation, which every non-Christian is going to face. Look at the book of Revelation, last book. Go to Revelation 20. This is not politically correct today. It's not accepted. This is a new phenomenon, in our, in our, especially in our country in the last 50, 60 years, with political correctness and inclusivism, inclusivist uh, added, uh, ideology, um, and also the postmodern era that we live in, which rejects the Bible in this country and rejects Jesus Christ and Christianity and the atonement. So the Bible says, in contradiction to what the world's going to tell you on the, in the media, television, uh, your family members or some people or your friends or uh, neighbors, they're going to talk to you a different total message, a, a message that's antithetical to what the scriptures teach. Every member in the human race, unless they believe in Jesus, if they don't believe in Jesus Christ, they're going to eternal condemnation. That's suffering in the lake of fire under the wrath of God forever. That's serious business. We've been, that's one thing. You think you're having a bad day? Well, you've been delivered from that through faith in Christ. That in itself should give you a good day. <laughs> you should never have a, we should never have any bad days when we realize and meditate and think about that. Think about that. I try to do that every day. Thank God you, you, you delivered me from the lake of fire. I could have gone there. Look at, look at it says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. This will be at the second advent of Christ. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, the beast being the Antichrist. And had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, his millennial reign. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who is part in the first resurrection. We're all right. We're okay. We're in that. Over these, the second death, there's no power. But they'll be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with them for a thousand years. Then it says in verse 7, when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. Now listen to this. Where the beast and the false prophet, two human beings, are also... And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now listen to me. Listen to me carefully. This teaching is out there all over the place. It's called annihilationism, we call it. It's a pe people say that when you, you're an unbeliever, if you die, and this is coming from some churches today. It's false doctrine. They say when you die, that's it. You're extinguished. You no longer exist. That passage blows that idea out of the water. Because if they were just terminated, no longer existing, the false prophet and the, and the Antichrist, why are they tormented day and night forever and ever? Why are they still there in the lake of fire after a thousand years? If they were just gone and no longer existing after their death, why are they still alive in the lake of fire? Think about that. So beware of the teaching out there that's it's called annihilationism, meaning 
when the, sin, the unbeliever dies, he no longer exists. Well, here's two believers here, uh, uh, two unbelievers here, are human beings at that, the beast and the false prophet, the antichrist and the false prophet. And they're tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, if they would just died and that was it for them, why are they still tormented night and day forever and ever? So it's either what you can either believe what the world says or what the word of God says. So there it is. We got delivered from that through faith alone and Christ alone. It's easy to get saved. But why don't people come to the Savior? Stubborn, arrogant pride. They don't want to, they want to live the way they want to live, like their father the devil. And I think some of us, we got to remember, we got to keep praying, never give up on people. All right? I mean, look at what happened with Paul. Paul was going to lake of fire. He was, he was persecuting the church, yet God saved him. Right? And he made a big deal out of that, Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 1. I was the chief of sinners. You know why he says that? Because he persecuted Jesus Christ's church. He had people put to death. He held the cloaks of Stephen, a cloaks of those who stoned Stephen in chapter 8 of the book of Acts. Yet God, he's saved. Moses, a murderer, is saved. Moses killed somebody cold-blooded. God didn't want him to do that. He killed an Egyptian with his bare hands. David, an adulterer and a murderer. I mean, the sins that David committed were horrible. And his son Solomon, he loved it. He, his, his love for his foreign wives took him away from devotion to, to, his, to God. But yet he's in heaven. All these people, wicked sinners, are in heaven today. Not because of what they did, human self-righteousness, but what Christ did for them. Their faith appropriated for them the, de the victory, of deliverance, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So at the moment, you and I as sinners exercise faith in Jesus Christ the Savior. The Holy Spirit appropriated for us this deliverance provided by Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. At the moment of our conversion, the Holy Spirit regenerates us and identifies us with Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection. Very important. So in Titus 3.5, when it says he saved us, the Father saved us, that's a reference to the Christian's deliverance from eternal condemnation the sin nature, personal sins, condemnation from the law as a result of not keeping the law perfectly, as well as slavery to sin and Satan and his cosmic system. So the Christian salvation, like his sanctification, is in three stages. First of all, this positional. So go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And I'll explain these. Sometimes when people look, and I've talked about this in the past, they look in their Bibles, and they see the word salvation, and immediately they think of it in, in relation to what we call justification, meaning you're, you're an unbeliever, you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're saved. But the Bible talks about being saved in stages, not meaning it's, a, it's progressive only in the sense that, uh, in the sense that you, there's a uh, positional one, there's an experiential, and then there's a perfective sense. And I'll explain each of those for you. But you've got to remember, uh, in the Bible, when it uses salvation, the context will determine which stage of salvation, uh, of the Christian salvation is being referred to. So look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Now, salvation, as I said before, is in three stages. The first is you trust in Jesus. You're, you're a sinner. You're an unbeliever. You trust in Jesus Christ, the Savior. At that moment, you've been delivered from eternal condemnation, things we mentioned before, sin, the sin nature, slavery to the sin, the sin nature and the devil, condemnation from the law, you were delivered from those things. At the moment you trusted in Jesus Christ as Savior. But something happened at the moment you did that. The Holy Spirit identified you with Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. Meaning, when Christ died and was raised from the dead, God considers you to have died and been raised with him. Okay? Remember, you were dead in Adam. Now you're alive in Christ. So, positionally, that speaks of what God, how God views you and I. Crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ. And it was accomplished at the moment of our conversion through the baptism of the Spirit when the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit placed us in union with Christ. In other words, the positional aspect of our salvation refers to the past action of God saving us from sin and Satan and the eternal condemnation 
when we trust in Jesus as our Savior. So look at uh, uh, Ephesians 2.1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Speaking of Christians, and he's saying prior to your conver conversion, prior to having faith in Jesus, you were spiritually dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the, the devil, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, the unsaved. Among them, the unsaved, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, when, even when we were dead spiritually and our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. That's the positional aspect of our salvation. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You hear me say we're identified with Christ in his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his session at the right hand of the Father. That's the bat through the baptism in the Spirit. That's our identification with Christ. So God the Father, this is very important for our self-esteem issues and issues that we've dealt with in the past that have been traumatic. God wants you to look at yourself as he looks at you, not according to your failures or your pre-conversion state. You've died with Christ. You've been raised with Christ. You've been seated with Christ. That's how God looks at you and I. That's so important. It's called positional truth. It's through the baptism of the Spirit, and it's extremely important. So then we're supposed to con concentrate, set our minds on those things about our relationship with Christ. M think about that. That's, that's what it says in Colossians 3, 2. Set your mind on these things. So then he goes on to say in verse 7, and he did all this, the Father did, so that in the ages that come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you've been saved. Saved to what? From, from eternal condemnation. The devil, sin. You've heard me say it. How so? Through faith in Christ. And that not of yourselves. Same thing Paul said in, in Titus 3.5. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Let's I'll give you an analogy. Somebody knocks on your door. I'm going to give you $10 million. Oh, yeah? What's the catch? Uh, you just need to believe that I can give you $10 million and I will give it to you. Okay. And then you get the $10 million. It's a gift. You don't, earn, you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to do anything for it. All you have to do is trust in the person. Yeah, I believe that you're able to give me $10 million. And you get the $10 million. Well, God has done much more for us. He's given us much more, something more valuable than $10 million, eternal life. So, the, so it's, not, it's a gift. You don't earn it or work for it. You don't deserve it. It's God flowing from his love and his mercy that he's done these things for us. Eternal salvation, our deliverance from eternal condemnation and sin and Satan is a gift. You don't purchase, a, you don't purchase a salvation. You can't pay the money to the church to get into heaven. It's faith alone and Christ alone, which is compatible with God's grace. Now that's the positional aspect of, of our salvation. Again, meaning when you trusted in Jesus Christ the Savior, God identified you with Christ in his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection and session. You saw the identification with his resurrection and session in this passage. Romans 6 talks about our being crucified with Christ and died with Christ and raised with Christ. And Romans chapter 6 teaches that as well. So in other words, it's interesting, this positional aspect of our salvation refers to the past action of God saving us from sin when we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. And the believer's deliverance positionally sets up the potential. It's only a potential for us to experience this deliverance in time because this deliverance can only be experienced after conversion through obedience to the teaching of the Word of God, the Gospel. It also guarantees our ultimate deliverance at the rapture, which is based upon the sovereign decision of God and not the volition of man. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're coming near the end here, pretty much done. Look at Colossians chapter 1. Uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's 
probably not it either. <laughs> yeah, go, go over to 1 Corinthians 15. Sorry about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Giving you a workout here this morning. First Corinthians chapter 15. Remember, it's, that's right after Romans. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then you got uh, Romans, and then you got First Corinthians. So First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, the good news, which I preach to you, which also you received. See, they got saved. In which also you stand. You have eternal security. By which also, notice it's in the present tense now. You are saved. What's going on there? Well, he's saying you can experience your salvation in the present. People who are out of fellowship are not experiencing their deliverance from sin and Satan. So he says, by which gospel also you are saved. Notice it's not the past tense now, it's present tense. Then he says the condition, if you hold fast the word, meaning if you obey what the gospel, the word of God says, you'll experience your salvation. You'll be delivered in the present. People who are out of fellowship as Christians are not experiencing their deliverance. They're, they're living in, in prison to the devil and sin when they've been freed from it. So, he says, by which also you are saved, note the present tense, if, all, you, if you hold fast the word which I preached preach to you, unless you believed in vain. So, experiential, the experiential aspect of salvation it refers to this. After conversion, you and I can experience our deliverance from sin and Satan by appropriating by faith the teaching of the word of God that we've been crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ. This constitutes our spiritual life, people. Fellowship with God. In other words, the experiential aspect of salvation is, is used of the believer's deliverance in the present moment. Fellowship. So, then we have the perfective aspect of our salvation. Meaning at the resurrection of the church, the rapture of the church, you and I will be perfected. We'll be permanently and experientially experience deliverance from sin and Satan. We're permanently delivered at the rapture of the church from these things. Right now, when we get out of fellowship, we 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 are under the we we put ourselves under the bondage to uh, the devil and and sin. But when we confess our sins and obey what the Word of God says, now we're experiencing our salvation again from those things. So. Uh, the, the fact that we trusted in Jesus Christ at the moment of our conversion guarantees that we're going to be permanently delivered from these things that I've mentioned in the past. So in other words, the perfective aspect of salvation is used of our future deliverance. So salvation is in three tenses. Past, at our conversion. Present, our fellowship with God now in time after our conversion. And then future, the rapture of the church when we get our resurrection bodies and we're perfected. So, as we close here, just as in the believer's sanctification, their deliverance positionally sets up the potential for them to experience this deliverance in time because this deliverance can only be experienced after conversion through obedience to the teaching of the Word of God through the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. It also guarantees our ultimate deliverance at the rapture, which is based upon the sovereign decision of God rather than the volition of the believer. You and I can experience our sanctification and our salvation, i.e. our victory over sin and Satan and his cosmic system through the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit by appropriating by faith the teaching of the Word of God that we've been crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ. You've died with Christ. You've raised with Christ. You're seated with Christ. God wants you to take that position in Christ. Accept it by faith and you'll experience your deliverance. Let me give you an example. A temptation comes on to sin, whether it could be sexual or for greed or whatever the sin is, and you're tempted. You have a choice. You can say, well, I'm not going to do that. I've died with Christ. I'm raised and seated with Christ. Sin does not have any power over me. Why would I want to put myself back into the prison cell? It's like, the, so you, when you say no to those things that are going to cause you to sin, and you say, I'm not going to do those things because I've died with Christ. If I've died with Christ, why would I want to sin? God can, has delivered me from that. I don't have to sin. 
I'm only going to sin because I choose to, and I don't want to do that. That's why Paul says, I crucify with Christ. Nevertheless, not I that live, but Christ lives in me, and I live by what? Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Love for him is motivated by his love for us when we were his enemies. So, that, so deliverance from sin and Satan, God, that's our salvation. God wants us to experience that now in time and not have to wait till the rapture of the church. And you, you and I, you know, so when we don't, when we, you know, for instance, let's give an analogy. Let's say you are a ex -con, you're a convict. You're in a prison cell. And then by the grace of somebody, you're, uh, you're ransomed out of that. You don't have to go s sit in the prison cell anymore. You can get out of the prison cell. You're free because of some benefactor of yours. Well, you'd be a fool to go out there in the world and say, you know what, I want to go back into the prison cell. Wouldn't you be crazy and somebody's freed you from the prison cell? But that's what we do when we sin. We throw ourselves right back in the prison cell. Then we have to confess our sins. We do what God tells us, and now we're, we're not back in that prison cell anymore. Why go back into the prison cell where sin and Satan has incarcerated us? Why go back there? Why don't we stay in fellowship with God? So we have to look at ourselves, very important. We have to look at ourselves as God looks at us. He says we've died with Christ. He says we're raised with Christ. We're seated with Christ. Why are we looking back at our past failures? I mean, it's good to look in the past to see what God has done for us to give us encouragement that he's with us in the present. We get miserable and upset and all worked up and get out of fellowship with God as a result because we're not concentrating and thinking about our relationship with Jesus Christ and what that is. You know, um, I heard you guys talking about uh, meditation and stuff. Biblical meditation is different from worldly meditation. Biblical meditation, uh, you are, the world's meditation is like the Beatles did with Maharishi and all that, is you empty your mind. But what the Bible meditation is, and it's talked about many passages in the Bible, is you're filling your mind with the word of God, God's thoughts. So God wants you and I to think about who we are in Christ and what that means, and to, constant, and to set our minds on the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Remember Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. So this is an exciting thing. God saved us through his son, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago. He saved us. What are we going to do with that? We're going to have fellowship with God. We're going to appropriate by faith our position with Christ. That's the proper thing to do, not live in our sin and, 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 and living for self. So you've been a great audience. Let's uh, close in prayer. Father, we just thank you for this time, time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would make all these things that we've mentioned here this morning real and understandable to all your children and that your children would begin to make application of these things and would continue to uh, would experience the joy of having fellowship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, that we would all experience our deliverance from sin and Satan and, and uh, all the, t the terrible things are, that we experienced or in bondage to prior to our conversion. And if there's anyone listening to my voice on the internet or pal talk that has not believed in Jesus Christ, I'm here to tell you that God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely born son that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. For the Father did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. You have a volition, a free will, and you could say to the Father in your own words, that you believe in his son, Jesus Christ. Now, to believe in Jesus Christ is not simply acknowledging his existence, but it's an acknowledgement that you're a sinner and you need a savior, and Jesus is your only savior. So the choice is yours. It doesn't cost you anything. You don't have to raise a hand, walk an aisle, give money to this church. You don't have to do so many good deeds. You could do, never do enough good deeds as a sinner to gain the approbation and acceptance of a holy God. So we have to trust in another, and God has provided that person in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. So whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life. I also have to warn you that if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you're under eternal condemnation, you're under the wrath of God, and the eternal condemnation is forever and ever in the lake of fire. It is not a metaphor. It's a real place where sinners are facing the wrath of God for all of eternity. Now, people go there not because God wants them to go there.
because we know that God desires all men to be saved. People go there because they refuse to do things God's way, and they live to, want to live independently of Him, which is just like their father, the devil. So my prayer, and the prayer of all of this church, is that you would trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Again, we thank you for this time to fellowship in your word, Father, and we pray for this class in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, we're going to take up our Sunday morning offering. Now we take up our Sunday morning offering. Remember um, what it says in Galatians chapter uh, 6. It says in Galatians 6, 6, and I'll read it to you. One of the reasons why we take up an offering. Galatians 6, 6 says, The one who is taught the word as to share all good things with the one who teaches him. And uh, for those who, uh, who might be on our website viewing this class, uh, you can, uh, if you uh, feel led to give and you're receiving from this ministry, uh, you can go to the uh, homepage the, on our website, which has, uh, uh, pay, uh, you can go to PayPal if you want to, or our, our mailing address is there if you want to send us something that's between you and God. But it does say in Galatians 6, 6, the one who has taught the word of God is to share all good things with those who teach him. So uh, let's uh, pray for this offering. Father, we just thank you for this time to study you. Your word, and we just pray, Father, that this offering, that your people would give this out of love and appreciation for your word and this ministry, and that they would be blessed by giving, because your son taught it's more blessed to give than to receive. We pray that you would uh, also uh, you would meet our needs, and we thank you for those who have been faithful in helping us out with our financial uh, responsibilities, and we just uh, thank you for uh, your blessings that you've given to your people so that they could share all good things with the one who teaches them. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, page 104, I'm going to do Love Each Other Like the Lord. And then I heard that there's a wonderful lasagna upstairs. But I think the donuts might go fast, too, because I saw uh, Tyler and Cheyenne with the donuts over there. Look at that. Son came to show the father's love that he has for this world lost in sin, helping the hopeless. Jesus won the victory that we could not win. There is no greater love than his sacrificial death for you and me. If he so loved us. We must love each other just like Calvary. Gotta love each other like the Lord. Gotta love each other like the Lord. Yeah. Love, love, love. Love, love. love and gave us life and all that Jesus won when we were dead once the spirit joined the kiss God one only son man here to Jesus our Savior whose sacrificial dead has set us free if he so loved us we must Love each other just like Calvary. Gotta 
love each other like a lord. Gotta love each other like a lord. Oh, yeah. Love, love, love. Missed.